Chapter Four, Part One of the Eight Strokes of the Clock. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lindy. The Eight Strokes of the Clock by Maurice Leblanc. Chapter Four, Part One. The Telltale Film. Do look at the man who's playing the butler, said Serge Renin. What is there peculiar about him? asked Hortense. They were sitting in the balcony at a picture palace, to which Hortense had asked to be taken, so that she might see on the screen the daughter of a lady, now dead, who used to give her piano lessons. Rose André, a lovely girl with lissom movements and a smiling face, was that evening figuring in a new film, The Happy Princess, which she lit up with her high spirits and her warm, glowing beauty. Henin made no direct reply, but, during a pause in the performance, continued. I sometimes console myself, for an indifferent film, by watching the subordinate characters. It seems to me that those poor devils, who are made to rehearse certain scenes ten or twenty times over, must often be thinking of other things than their parts at the time of the final exposure. And it's great fun noting those little moments of distraction which reveal something of their temperament, of their instinct self. As, for instance, in the case of that butler, look. The screen now showed a luxurious served table. The happy princess sat at the head, surrounded by all her suitors. Half a dozen footmen moved about the room, under the orders of the butler, a big fellow with a dull, coarse face a common appearance and a pair of enormous eyebrows which met across his forehead in a single line. "'He looks a brute,' said Hortense. "'But what do you see in him that's peculiar? "'Just note how he gazes at the princess, "'and tell me if he doesn't stare at her oftener than he ought to.' "'I really haven't noticed anything so far,' said Hortense. "'Why, of course he does,' Serge Renin declared. "'It is quite obvious that in actual life he entertains for Rose André personal feelings which are quite out of place in a nameless servant. It is possible that, in real life, no one has any idea of such a thing, but on the screen, when he is not watching himself, or when he thinks that the actors at rehearsal cannot see him, his secret escapes him. Look! The man was standing still. It was the end of dinner. The princess was drinking a glass of champagne, and he was gloating over her, with his glittering eyes half hidden behind their heavy lids. Twice again they surprised in his face those strange expressions to which Renin ascribed an emotional meaning which Hortense refused to see. "'It's just his way of looking at people,' she said. The first part of the film ended. There were two parts, divided by an entr'acte. The notice on the program stated that a year had elapsed and that the happy princess was living in a pretty Norman cottage, all hung with creepers, together with her husband, a poor musician." The princess was still happy, as was evident on the screen, still as attractive as ever, and still besieged by the greatest variety of suitors. Nobles and commoners, peasants and financiers, men of all kinds fell swooning at her feet. And prominent among them was a sort of boorish solitary, a shaggy, half-wild woodcutter, whom she met whenever she went out for a walk. Armed with his axe, a formidable, crafty being, he prowled around the cottage and the spectators felt with a sense of dismay that a peril was hanging over the happy prince's head. "'Look at that,' whispered Hanin. "'Do you realize who the man of the woods is?' "'No. Simply the butler. The same actor is doubling the two bards.' In fact, notwithstanding the new figure which he cut, the butler's movements and postures were apparent under the heavy gait and rounded shoulders of the woodcutter, even as under the unkempt beard and long, thick hair, the once clean-shaven face was visible with the cruel expression and the bushy line of the eyebrows. The princess, in the background, was seen to emerge from the thatched cottage. The man hid himself behind a clump of trees. From time to time the screen displayed, on an enormously enlarged scale, his fiercely rolling eyes or his murderous hands with their huge thumbs. "'The man frightens me,' said Hortense. "'He's really terrifying.' because he's acting on his own account, said Renin. You must understand that, in the space of three or four months that appears to separate the dates at which the two films were made, 
his fashion has made progress. And to him, it is not the princess who is coming, but Rosandre. The man crouched low. The victim approached, gaily and unsuspectingly. She passed, heard a sound, stopped, and looked about her with a smiling air, which became attentive, then uneasy, and there more and more anxious. The woodcutter had pushed aside the branches, and was coming through the copse. They were now standing face to face. He opened his arms as though to seize her. She tried to scream, to call out for help, but the arms closed around her before she could offer the slightest resistance. Then he threw her over his shoulder and began to run. "'Are you satisfied?' whispered Renin. "'Do you think that this fourth-rate etcher would have had all that strength and energy if it had been any other woman than Rose Andre?' Meanwhile, the woodcutter was crossing the skirt of a forest and plunging through great trees and masses of rocks. After setting the princess down, he cleared the entrance to a cave which the daylight entered by a slanting crevice. A succession of views displayed the husband's despair, the search and the discovery of some small branches which had been broken by the princess and which showed the path that had been taken. Then came the final scene, with the terrible struggle between the man and the woman, when the woman vanquished and exhausted, is flung to the ground, the sudden arrival of the husband, and the shot that puts an end to the brute's life. "'Well,' said Renin, when they had left the picture palace, and he spoke with a certain gravity, "'I maintain that the daughter of your old piano teacher has been in danger ever since the day when that last scene was filmed. I maintain that this scene represents not so much an assault by the men of the woods on the happy princess as a violent and frantic attack by an actor on the woman he desires. Certainly, it all happened within the bounds prescribed by the part, and nobody saw anything in it, nobody except, perhaps, Rosentrey herself. But I, for my part, have detected flashes of passion which leave not a doubt in my mind. I have seen glances that betray the wish and even the intention to commit murder. I have seen clenched hands ready to strangle, in short, a score of details which proved to me that, at that time, the man's instinct was urging him to kill the woman who could never be his. And it all amounts to what? We must protect Rosandre, if she is still in danger, and if it is not too late. And to do this, we must get hold of further information. From whom? From the World Cinema Company, which made the film. I will go to them tomorrow morning. Will you wait for me in your flat about lunchtime? At heart, Hortense was still skeptical. All these manifestations of passion, of which she denied neither the ardor nor the ferocity, seemed to her to be the rational behavior of a good actor. She had seen nothing of the terrible tragedy which Renin contended that he had divined, and she wondered whether he was not erring through an excess of imagination. Well, she asked next day, not without a touch of irony, how far have you got? Have you made a good bag? Anything mysterious? Anything thrilling? Pretty good. Oh, really? And your so-called lover? Is one Daubrecq, originally a scene painter, who played the butler in the first part of the film, and the men of the woods in the second, and was so much appreciated that they engaged him for a new film. Consequently, he has been acting lately. He was acting near Paris, but on the morning of Friday, the 18th of September, he broke into the garage of the World Cinema Company and made off with a magnificent card and forty thousand francs in money. Information was lodged with the police, and on the Sunday the car was found, a little way outside Dreux. And up to now the angry has revealed two things, which will appear in the papers tomorrow. First, Daubrecq is alleged to have committed a murder which created a great stir last year, the murder of Bourguet, the jeweler. Secondly, on the day after his two robberies, Daubrecq was driving through Le Havre, in a motor-car, with two men who helped him to carry off, in broad daylight and in a crowded street, a lady whose identity has not yet been discovered. Rosandre? asked Hortense uneasily. I have just been to Rosandre's. The World Cinema Company gave me her address. Rosandre spent this summer traveling, and then stayed for a fortnight in the Seine Inferieure, where she has a small place of her own, the actual cottage in The Happy Princess. On receiving an invitation from America to do a film there, she came back to Paris, registered her luggage at the Gare Saint-Lazare, and left on Friday the 18th of September, intending to sleep at Le Havre and take Saturday's boat. 
Friday the 18th, muttered Hortense, the same day in which that man... And it was on the Saturday that a woman was carried off by him at Le Havre. I looked in at the Compagnie Transatlantique, and a brief investigation showed that Rosendre had booked a cabin, but that the cabin remained unoccupied. The passenger did not turn up. This is frightful. She has been carried off. You were right. I fear so. What have you decided to do? Adolphe, my chauffeur, is outside with the car. Let us go to Le Havre. Up to the present, Rosendre's disappearance does not seem to have become known. Before it does, and before the police identify the woman carried off by Dalbrec, with the woman who did not turn up to claim her cabin, we will get on Rosendre's track. There was not much said on the journey. At four o'clock, Hortense and Renin reached Rouen. But here, Renin changed his road. Adolphe, take the left bank of the Seine. He unfolded the motoring map on his knees, and, tracing the route with his finger, showed Hortense that, if you draw a line from Le Havre, or rather from Quillebeuf, where the road crosses the Seine, to Dreux, where the stolen car was found, this line passes through Routeau, a market town lying west of the forest of Bretonne. Now, it was in the forest of Bretonne, he continued, according to what I heard, that the second part of The Happy Princess was filmed, and the question that arises is this. Having got hold of Rosandre, would it not occur to Dalbrec, when passing near the forest on the Saturday night, to hide his prey there, while his two accomplices went on to Dreux, and from there returned to Paris? The cave was quite near. Was he not bound to go to it? How should he do otherwise? Wasn't it while running to this cave a few months ago that he held in his arms, against his breast, within reach of his lips, the woman whom he loved and whom he was now conquered? By every rule of fate and logic, the adventure is being repeated all over again, but this time in reality. Rosentre is a captive. There is no hope of rescue. The forest is vast and lonely. That night, or on one of the following nights, Rosentre must surrender, or die. Hortense gave a shudder. We shall be too late. Besides, you don't suppose that he's keeping her a prisoner? Certainly not. The place I have in mind is at a crossroads and is not a safe retreat, but we may discover some clue or other. The shades of night were falling from the tall trees when they entered the ancient forest of Proton, full of Roman remains and medieval relics. Renin knew the forest well, and remembered that near a famous oak known as the wine-cask, there was a cave, which must be the cave of the happy princess. He found it easily, switched on his electric torch, rummaged in the dark corners, and brought Hortense back to the entrance. "'There's nothing inside,' he said. "'But here is the evidence which I was looking for.' Daubrecq was obsessed by the recollection of the film, but so was Rosandre. The happy princess had broken off the tips of the branches on the way through the forest, Rosandre has managed to break off some to the right of this opening, in the hope that she would be discovered as on the first occasion. Yes, said Hortense, it's a proof that she has been there, but the proof is three weeks old, since that time. Since that time, she is either dead and buried under a heap of leaves, or else alive in some hole even lonelier than this. If so, where is he? Renin pricked up his ears. Repeated blows of the axe were sounding from some distance, no doubt coming from a part of the forest that was being cleared. He? said Renin. I wonder whether he may not have continued to behave under the influence of the film, and whether the man of the woods in The Happy Princess has not quite naturally resumed his calling. For how is the man to live, to obtain his food, without attracting attention? He will have found a job. We can't make sure of that. We might by questioning the woodcutters whom we can hear. The cart took them by a forest road to another crossroads, where they entered on foot a track which was deeply rooted by wagon wheels. The sound of axes ceased. After walking for a quarter of an hour, they met a dozen men who, having finished work for the day, were returning to the villages nearby. "'Will this path take us to Routot?' asked Renin, in order to open a conversation with them. No, you're turning your backs on it, said one of the men gruffly, and he went on, accompanied by his mates. Hortense and Renin stood rooted to the spot. They had recognized the butler. His cheeks and chin were shaved, but his upper lip was covered by a black moustache, evidently dyed. 
the eyebrows no longer met and were reduced to normal dimensions. End of chapter 4, part 1